This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library podcast is brought to you by the show's incredible Patreon supporters. And I want to take a second and say thank you to all of you who support the show. You can join the Writers Club for the podcast and get solo episodes and the chance to submit questions for monthly Q&A audio at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 149 of the Secret Library podcast. My guest this week is Anne Choma, a writer and historical researcher. She's the author of Gentleman Jack, The Real Anne Lister, and is also the historical consultant on the HBO original series. Anne Choma began transcribing Anne Lister's diaries as part of her thesis at university and is now known as a foremost expert in Anne Lister's life. She lives in Yorkshire, not far from where the Brontes lived and can nearly see Anne Lister's land from her home. It was such a delight talking to Anne Choma about Anne Lister. I was, I was pretty much into talking about this book the second I heard about encrypted diaries, Anne Lister is such an amazing personality, such an amazing groundbreaking woman who lived well before anyone was debating gay marriage or the possibility of gay marriage in the news. And she married a woman in the 1800s. So the fact of her keeping a diary that was millions of words long large percentages of which are encrypted, is a fascinating and wonderful thing to know. It's very exciting to talk to Anne Choma about the process, both of transcribing the diaries, interacting with the diaries, and the incredible community that has grown up around Anne Lister's diaries, which are now considered a national treasure and an international treasure in many ways because of the historical significance they provide. So it was a delight talking to her, not only about writing this book, bringing such an incredible person to life in the book, consulting on a show about her life, as well as getting comfortable in transcribing encrypted diaries. So I know you're going to love hearing from Anne Choma as much as I did. She is really special. So here we go with Anne Choma. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome, Caroline. It's great to, to be speaking to you. So I'm really interested in how you first became acquainted with Anne Lister and who she was in history and what really drew you to her, given that you're now such an expert on her and her life. Well, it started um, a long time ago um, um, in the early 1990s. Um, I began transcribing her diaries um, when I focused on Anne's life as a subject for my master's degree at university. So at Leeds University um, in Yorkshire, which is not far from Anne's ancestral home, Shipton Hall. And uh, it was it became um, a love affair from that point, really, and it's continued ever since. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, so uh, so that's where it all began. And uh, I began going to the archives and researching and reading letters and trying to start reading the diaries, which were incredibly difficult. Um, and so it's been a bit of a, an apprentice, apprenticeship um, for, you know, a long, long time. And it continues to be because Anne's diaries are... Are a challenge, and um, of course, we we know that she she writes in in two kinds of style. So she writes in a plain hand and in a crypt hand, where she uses her secret code. So you have to become acquainted with her style of writing before you can start making sense of what she's saying. Yeah, this is something that really sucked me in learning about Anne Lister was that this encrypted diary. I was like, okay, you had me at encrypted diary. So was yeah. there any reference material for you to go from, or did you have to figure out, did you have to crack the code, basically, when you were transcribing them? Yeah, I didn't have to crack the code. I mean, the, the, the key to the code is accessible to anybody who wants to have a go and try and read Anne's diaries, um, uh, the passages that are in crypt hands. So the, the key is there for anybody to to have a look at. And um, each letter of the alphabet has a specific um, Co, um, letter or symbol or Greek 
um, letter of the alphabet attached to it. So it's there. Anybody can access, access it. And the, the actual code itself was cracked in the late 19th century by one of Anne's um, ancestors called John, John Lister and his friend Arthur Burrell. So the that was the start of it. They cracked the code from one small word, and that, that word was hope. And from those four letters, they managed to decrypt um, the rest of the, 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 the cryptic code that she had written. Um, and from then on, it, it's continued with various researchers who've, who've worked on Anne's diaries. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's an apprenticeship. Once you have the knowledge and you can, you, if you're prepared to work at it, um, it, it becomes easier. But um, one of the things about Anne's, Anne's code is that there, are no, there is no punctuation. You're often dealing with archaic language. So there's lots of other um, pressures on you as well to try and make sense of what she's talking about. That's so fascinating. So given that the codes were cracked before, what was the experience like for you to go to the original material as a way to get to know Anne as a person who becomes a character really in your book? It was, it was, in a word, Caroline, it was terrifying because um, I don't, I mean, I don't know if you've seen an original um, uh, page of the diary, but it, it is almost like a foreign language. Um, and the plain hand and the crypt hand run effortlessly um, together. So she can be um, writing in plain hand, which is to all intents and purposes, normal English in inverted commas. Um, and then she'll just suddenly break into crypt hand anything that she wants to keep secret or hidden from, from anybody. Um, so, and, and also the, the, it's, it's fairly, it, once you, once you've practiced it and once you become familiar with it and it, and it's hard work, um, anybody who's worked on the diaries before will understand that. And quite often you can, you can have, um, you know, up to a thousand words per page of diary. Um, and, uh, very closely written together so there's all of these um, issues to to get around and then to understand the little kind of uh, personal things that she has within her writing all the sort of secret um, abbreviations that she uses as well so you have to kind of make sense of all those before you can get any kind of idea of what she's um of who Anne is herself um, right. I mean the diaries themselves are very very interesting because um, you know, you can you can read them as almost almost as if there are two textual narratives going on there. Um, you know, where, where the reader's got to tease out and learn something about the writer. Um, it's almost like you know, Anne Lister set the reader a text, even though she she wrote the diary, you know, purely for her own eyes. It's she kind of put you know traps in there for you know just in case anybody wanted to 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 read them, um, and. Uh, you know, with a novel, for example, you know what the narrative is going to be. It's almost it's formed by the author. The decisions have been made. The characters and the plots have been formed. It kind of follows a linear structure. But with Anne's diaries, as with any diary, you never know what's going to come next. It evolves over time, and and as does the character of and life of the author, as was the case with Anne. Um, so, so for me, you know, her diaries represent a great challenge uh, because. Her identity for me, as I as I've been transcribing, and as I've always, when I've always worked on the diaries, and when I was doing my master's thesis, it's almost like her identity was trapped between these two forms of distinct writing, the plain hand and the crypt hand. Um, so the great challenges for anybody who's who's wanting to know more about Anne Lister. Yes, in in some ways, it feels like. The crypt hand and the plain hand mirrors the way that she had to live in her everyday life. There were things that she could come right out and talk about, and then there were things that she couldn't. So it feels like the diary mirrors her everyday existence. Absolutely. I mean, she, Anne Lister was such a contradictory and complex character. I mean, we can say all the things that we know very you know, the basic things we know about her, that she was a diarist, she was a businesswoman, she was a lesbian who wrote about her relationships in a secret mode, in a secret code. Um, we can say all those things about her, um, but she was so much, she's such a contradictory character, such a complex character. Um, 
you know, she's she's often described as a feminist, but she wasn't. She wasn't a feminist because she wasn't a trailblazer and she wasn't a campaigner. There's, um, I mean, even though her marriage to Ann Walker, um, her subsequent marriage to Ann Walker was groundbreaking um, in the sense that it, it predates, you know, almost 200 years, the legalisation of gay marriage today. There's so much more about that was not predictable, you know, um, in society, like in the way that her diary has two distinct forms of writing, she was almost like a split personality. So she was one minute extrovert and the other minute reserved, you know, um, in love, you know, in her relationship, she was devoted as much as she was inconstant. There's all these different competing aspects of her character that make her a tricky person to understand. So how did you go about... So you wrote your master's thesis about the diaries and then you came to write Gentleman Jack. So where did the idea for that project, you know, focusing more on the period of time surrounding her marriage to Ann Walker, how did you Mm. decide on the framework of that book and to create that project? For the last two years, I've been involved um, with Sally Wainwright as her advisor on the um, HBO BBC drama Gentleman Jack um, and the book that I've written Gentleman Jack the Real Anne Lister is the official tying companion to the drama and, and what the book does it gives greater context and detail to the programme about Anne and her life so essentially it follows the same story as the drama which focuses on um, two main narratives which is the relationship Anne has with Anne Walker and Anne's determination to compete with her business rival, Christopher Rawson, um, uh, to sink her own pits, her own coal pits. So, I mean, it's, um, it follows that kind of uh, trajectory, does the book, but in greater detail, it gives a much more in-depth picture of Anne's life, and there's a substantial introduction to Anne and her life as well. Um, so for, the, for my involvement, um, with Sally was to um, uh, transcribe the diaries mainly. And um, I spent the last two years transcribing um, hundreds of thousands of words for for the drama, um, in excess of at least 300,000 words, um, so that Sally could um, write her script and tease out the narrative detail that she wanted that for the drama. That's fascinating. How did it change your approach knowing that there was both a book and a TV series? Because I think the the sort of the way you might structure a narrative, if you were simply writing your own historical biography just for its own sake, versus knowing that working with Sally, there was going to be a show. Did that change your method at all? Um, yeah, I think it did. And we played around with different styles about, you know, how we should approach it. Um, and um, I was, I, you know, I've, I've kind of come from the background of, of you know, just sort of working on an academic theses. So I knew that this book had to be um, uh, appealed to a wider audience. So, I mean, you'll, you'll know from your own reading of it, Caroline, that it's, it's very much a storytelling book um, with some, hopefully, some fantastic commentary in there as well. But the crucial thing was to follow the same story as we we told in the drama, which again is about the, her marriage to Anne Walker and how Anne comes back from um, how she recovers from heartbreak from the fall of our, fallout of a relationship. So it starts in the same way, but the key thing for me all the way through was to make it readable, enjoyable, and and to and to be very very choosy about the extracts we we had in there. Um, so I think, you know, when, when I was working as advisor for Sally, um, you know, many of the discussions we had was about trying to, um, was about trying to depict Anne as the remarkable human being that she was and how she stood out amongst her contemporaries. Um, but we also wanted to, um, within the confines of TV drama, we wanted to be able to show and Lister as a, a person who she would actually recognise herself, but would also speak to a modern, you know, a modern audience as well. So it was a fine balancing act between relying wholly on the diaries and, and 
and that tricky language and then for Sally trying to um, um, work with that language to produce a, a, a script that was um, understandable to a modern audience. But all the, all the time staying true to, to the, the, the journal and being as close as we could to um, Anne's own writing. This is something that's fascinating to me in terms of working with primary material, is that if you're working on a book, there is this need to present a coherent person who follows a story arc. But as you say, a diary doesn't always work that way. You know, you have a good day, you have a bad day, you're upset about something, you have a hard time. And clearly based on the level of detail in the excerpts that you included, she has this diary with her I, I envisioned it with her at all times and she's writing down her thoughts all the time and she thinks very carefully mm. about her life. She's not a casual, yeah. let it all happen. She's very involved in what does this mean and how do I proceed? And so yeah, absolutely. how was it? I mean, it must have been a huge process as much to decide what was included as what is left out and what's determined, okay, we don't need to include that because you could make probably a mini series that lasted until the end of time with a diarist who's quite this mm -hmm. enthusiastic about keeping all of her records. It was the hardest thing. It, it, that was the hardest thing, both in, in writing the book and, and for Sally in writing the script um, was, was choosing what to leave out and, it was it was almost painful to have to leave some of it out, but you have to make choices with anything. And you know, with a book around for a book of around a hundred thousand words, um, it's a fine balance. And as long as I think if you're trying, if you tell the story as well as you can do, and and choose the extracts that best um, uh, depict what you're trying to say and what I'm trying to say, I think you, you know it's a winning formula. And I think. Um, when Sally worked with the transcripts that I'd um, given her, I think she did a fantastic job because it was almost like she had to tra translate Anne's words again into um, into words that an audience would understand. But for Anne herself, I mean, she, as you said, she she did write her diary all the time. I mean, it was, it was every day of her life, um, and. Uh, it's very kind of scientific the way she would write. She would write, and uh, so you, you know there were patterns in the diary which made it um, simple, and, and did help in some respects when you are transcribing. Um, like for example, every day was started um, with the top left-hand page. A day would start with um, the recording of the temperature and of the weather, and it would end in that way as well. Um, and then the left-hand margin in the diaries would be for symbols to indicate perhaps that she received a letter or a note or when she read a book. Um, so there are, it's, it, she's very scientific in the way she approaches her journals. And so that helped me. And I'm sure, I'm sure it helps other people who are also transcribing the diary to know that what certain things um, are meaning um, at certain times in the day and, and what these little symbols mean. Um, so, it's um, it's uh, you know it's 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 a process of discovery working on on Anne's diaries all the time. That's so I love that I love the symbols and the in the framing of it. I'm of course curious. You said there were things that it was painful to leave out. Were there any particular stories um, that you can think of that you were really sad to leave out, but that you still think about or think are important to the life of Anne overall? Um, well, I think um, we haven't, once we'd formed um, the plots, um, sort of the narratives of the scripts, I think we were very clever because um, w without giving too much away, I can't obviously say too much about the drama at this moment in time because it's not aired yet. Right. Um, we were very, very careful not to um, um, talk about things in the drama that we couldn't do justice to. So we, we've purposely um, decided to leave things and perhaps we might be able to revisit those in, in, in further series. Um, and, we, 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 you know, we, ha we hope we can do that. I mean, there's some real larger-than-life characters in Anne's life that we weren't able to include. Um, but um, I think uh, 
you know, and 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 with any with any um, sixty minute, you know, each each episode is sixty minutes. Um, you have to be very very, um, I don't disciplined about about what you want to say in that sixty minutes. Um, so you know, the, the, the backdrop of the of the drama, uh, the political backdrop of the drama is set in in eighteen thirty two at the time of the Great Reform Act. I think, you know, we would have liked to have gone into greater detail about that, for example. But, um, you know, it, it's um, something that can be revisited, perhaps. Uh, but in the book, of course, it gives great, greater context to that. And that's where I feel the two work very well together. Um, so things that Sally couldn't include in the drama that we kind of hint at will be gone into in greater detail in the book. Um, and... Uh, and and for areas where we have amalgamated in some respects certain characters in Anne's life, um, which um, uh, which is very interesting way to include, um, you know, how to work a, a primary a primary source for a script um, is very interesting because again it it shows Sally's skill as a writer in, in in being able to tease out the truth from primary source but to adapt it for a drama and a script so for example, we have two characters in in Anne's, in Anne's journals, and uh, both of the characters are extremely interesting and and fun and full of you know full of life and uh Sally's adapted those characters to form. A little plot, a side plot, um, mm. which is very interesting. Um, but so there's lots of things going on like that. But as I say in the book, it's pure fact. Nothing. It's all historical. It's all from primary source, and 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 it gives this this added context to to the drama. It's kind of a, a wonderful way to explore a subject. Being able to have both that you can have this kind of what if and maybe take a little bit more of a risk in a in a drama because people don't expect you to be 100% unless you say it's a documentary. And then to have the book when everyone is interested in the history and that they can go further and say, well, what really did happen here? What did she say in the diary? And being able to read her words yeah. as they are. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great, a great way to put it. And I think, I think people want that, you know, I mean, I think this, you know, Gentleman Jack the Drama, written by Sally, it's, I've never seen anything like it. It's remarkable because I, I can't ever remember a drama that's been produced um, about where the lead, you know, where the, the leads are, are two women and such unusual, strong women. And I think, I think what we, one of the things that Sally and I both agreed on um, is that first and foremost, we wanted to show Anne as this remarkable human being and that she stood out amongst her people, um, that she was, you know, she was gifted intellectually, that she was a polymath, that she pushed boundaries throughout her life. We wanted to show all of those things. And I really think we do do that in the drama. And I think certainly in the book, it's the detailed knowledge that people can go to for this extra little bit of Anne's, Anne's amazing life. This, and, uh, you know, yeah, this was something that really stood out to me as well, was that, again, I mean, you think about challenges that people take on in life. Mm. And, and you, I can think about this in my own life, you know, where you think you, you yeah, do something yeah. and you look at it later and say, oh, my God, if I knew how difficult that was going to be, I wouldn't have even bothered. But you kind of mm -hmm. do it because it's it's happening and it's the present. And I'm thinking about the things that she accomplished, like, you know, taking over her family estate taking responsibility mm. for it and courting this heiress basically in an era when that sort of relationship was not common or openly talked about. It was sort of this open secret mm. in a way, these romantic friendships mm. that we hear about and that she has in many ways. Yes, she has disappointments, which we learn about earlier in the book with previous mm. situations, but that she <laughs> fundamentally maintains this optimism and just keeps going was I found mm. extraordinary and really inspiring. Yeah, she's the most life. She's such a life affirming character, Anne Lister. I mean, she said, and I quote, "Providence leaves us free, because we enthrall ourselves." Um, and you know, she was such a positive person. I mean, she 
she was she had she was blessed with good luck. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, she had a healthy sense of self-esteem. She was clever. She inherited an estate called Shibden in Yorkshire, which eventually gave her access to money that would have otherwise been denied her. Um, and she was accepted by her family. She accepted accepted her own sexuality as being God-given and natural. So she had all these things as her as her armour. But she believed, you know, as a person, she believed in consulting her own happiness. Um, I think because she she felt that was the the route through to a contented life, and in, and in fact, you know, she was she was so positive and so full of energy. Um, it was something that she wanted to teach Anne Walker, her eventual wife who suffered with anxiety. Um, and you know, she said she said of Anne Walker that she had everything to be wished for in life, but the courage to enjoy it. Um, there was never a moment in Anne's life where I don't think she ever stopped enjoying who she was, and um, and and you know, she always wanted to try and find a place in the world for herself that she felt happy with. Um, even though she was this extraordinary, contradictory and complex character, um, she believed in herself. Um, and I think, you know, we can't underestimate with Anne Lister just how important in uh, learning and books were to her. Um, you know, books and knowledge were her lifeblood. And as we're talking about books as well today and, and the book I've written, I think it's really important to mention that, um, you know, without without her books and without her reading, I, I, it's one thing I don't think she could have lived without, actually. Um, she said, what is there like gaining knowledge? All else is all else here below is indeed but vanity and vexation of spirit. I am happy among my books, but I am not happy without them. That's amazing. I I, I could say the same today. <laughs> yeah, um, she's, she's this extraordinary intellect, and um, you know she possessed this ex- uh, amazing um, knowledge of the classics, even from a very young age. Um, so she'd read, um, you know, Virgil, Tacitus, all these amazing um, ancient ancient writers, and she was she was very um, she was pompous, you know, at times, and she was a great comedian. You know, she she talked about she she described herself as being like some of these ancient mythical characters, um, you know, dep- depending on what was happening in her life and what situation she was in. I think this is something that's really still true today in many ways. Um, It may have expanded from just books, but when I think about the importance of writing, I mean, one thing she says from the beginning that I thought was really important is that she keeps talking about her ambition to write. And yet she's been writing all along in these diaries and the diaries have served as a legacy and a source of inspiration. So I think to those people who (laughs) fear writing or they think, oh, you know, who wants to hear my story or will my life be of interest that you look at someone mm-hmm. like Anne Lister, who granted was making choices and, and had access to things that maybe contemporaries, um, there weren't a lot of women running estates. There weren't a lot at that time, but she was able to take inspiration from the classics, as you say, and to then feel comfortable with herself because she saw there was a precedent. And now we can read about Anne Lister and feel yes. different kinds of inspiration today. Mm. And yeah, it's a fantastic way to look at it. And and as you say, I mean, she did harbour, you know, she had this long-held ambition to write and, and be published. And, um, and she, you know, she talked about writing and translating some of the classics and, and, um, and writing travel, travel, um, you know, writing extracts of her travels and forming a book out of them. Um, but all the time while she was thinking of this, she was actually writing her magnum opus. This is the fantastic thing that there she was, she was doing it and she didn't realise she was doing it. Or perhaps, you know, some people say she did realise she was doing it. But my understanding is that the diaries were only ever, ever written for her eyes. But there she was, she, she was producing this major piece of work that would have such a resonance um, today for anybody that's interested in the history of sexuality and gender or who just wants to know more about a time that we, you know, a time that was lost and that we never thought existed. Um, so, yeah, the diaries today and that, you know, are, are fantastic for that. They're an endless source of information. I think this is sort of the, the, the twist because we're always, I mean, 
having read an, a number of diaries of, of various people from various eras, I am always fascinated to read them and to to get access to this kind of information. And yet, as someone who keeps a diary, the thought of people hundreds of years from now reading mine is absolutely cringe-inducing. Um, <laughs> You know, mm. I, I, and I have the same thought, like, why would anyone be interested in this? Why would this be any source of information? And yet, you mm. know, she's she's created this opus, which is such a testament, as you say, to her time period and to choices she made that were unconventional. I think it's probably important to say something at this stage, um, Caroline, about the, the volume of the diaries. And, yes. You know, 24 volumes, I've met 24 major volumes around 5 million words, which which has gone up from the original 4 million words that we thought of because the diaries have recently been digitised um, through Sally Wainwright has, has uh, enabled the digitisation of the diaries. And so we now think there's around 5 million words and we know that there are 7,509 pages. Um, so it's, you know, it gives you some idea about how how important this is today when we have this kind of volume of history to work from. Um, and in fact, the the diaries have, in two, 2011, they were recognised by UNESCO as being a document of global, global significance. Amazing. For being one of the most, you know, uninterrupted social commentaries ever written. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic that we have this, this amazing document now and that we can all all work from it and, um, and and use it. And there's still so much more to discover. And I think, you know, for Sally and I, um, one of the major aims when we've talked is to to make the diaries more accessible and, and for people to become more involved in transcribing them. And um, and that's that's something we're still working on. And and the, the recent digitisation of the diaries, um, which will eventually be available through West Yorkshire Archives, hopefully will make that possible. So when you talk about the transcribing of it, what percentage of the diaries have been transcribed at this point? Well, I can only speak for myself. And Mm -hmm. um, I have um, read, I haven't read five million words. I can be honest about that. But I've read many hundreds of thousands of words in the diaries. And I've transcribed many hundreds of thousands of words in the diaries. And successive researchers and writers throughout the years have, have, have done similar things. So I think the, the ultimate dream and aim would be for somebody to come in and start transcribing from scratch. Um, it would be an absolute gargantuan task to do that. And, and, yes. and also would, would take significant finance to be able to fund it as well. But I think, you know, if more people become involved and start be, and start to become more proficient at, at reading Anne's journals, then it, it's a great possibility. That's um, amazing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, because if it's uh, given the the percentage or the presence of the cryptid language, you know, your your speed is obviously compromised as well as by the time period and the language and all of these things. I mean, hundreds of thousands of words is quite an accomplishment. Um, with all of that happening at the same time, it is, and it's um, it's you know, it's, it's the speed. Um, you know, it, I, I think I said at the beginning of this interview, you know, reading on list of diaries is, is like an apprenticeship. You know, you become better and better, and and when you leave it alone, you 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 need to try and relearn again. I mean, I'm at the stage now where I can read fluently, and I can read the plain hand, and I can read the crypt hand fluently. Um, but it still presents challenges every day. And um, at the moment, I'm still transcribing and um, still coming across, you know, different challenges around very, very complex language. And sometimes I have to go back to it. Um, and then eventually it comes. And uh, But uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process, but it's the most rewarding process. And I can't tell anybody out there who's listening um, that this, you know, to be able to do what I'm doing is an absolute joy and an honor. Absolutely. I mean, I can't think of anything more wonderful than if you're working on a book about a historical figure, having access to their most intimate thoughts and feelings and the inner workings of their mind really directly. I mean, it's amazing. And I think that 
you know, when you look back at historical periods, not everyone was keeping a diary, not every character that you, you know, historical figure that you think of. Um, it is, it does yeah. seem it was maybe somewhat more common than today, but not yeah, everyone was as thorough. Extra- yeah, but well, that's the thing, I think, with Anne, um, what's extraordinary about her journals is that it's almost like she went into a room, she she pressed the record button, and then she forgot to turn it off. You know, it's mm. like she, it was uninterrupted, and it was continuous, and it was systematic, and it was scientific, and it's just the repository of everything that she felt and and experienced in her life. Um, and that's what makes it truly unique. Apart from the fact that the main content or the significant part of the content is the fact that she dispelled the myth of the 19th century asexual woman. Um, and, and obviously that's what makes her extraordinary as well, because up until the point of Anne Lister writing, we always assumed that relationships between women in the 19th century were non-sexual um, and that they were confined to the populist thought of the image of the romantic friendship. And of course, she dispelled that myth. She was writing about the body. She was writing about sex. Um, and, uh, and again, that's what makes her journals very, very important today. Definitely. I mean, and it doesn't... Yes, she had the crypt hand, but it doesn't feel like, at least in the limited amounts that I was able to read in the context of the book, it doesn't feel like she's hiding it because she has any shame about it. It's more that she just doesn't want anyone else knowing about her private affairs the same way anyone wouldn't want somebody knowing about their private affairs today. Exactly. I mean, any, it wasn't just about her relationships that were confined to the code. It was anything that she didn't want anybody else to see. So it could be a financial matter. It could be a cutting comment about somebody in, in Halifax society. Um, it, it, you know, she, she would write anything in that code that she didn't want anybody else to see. Um, it could be something very, very boring, in fact, um, very, very mundane, like she wrote a copy of a letter for somebody. Um, so it was just that it was a way of, um, secreting information and, uh, we, we think, I mean, we, we assume from, from the totality of the diaries that there's around a sixth of the diaries written in code, but again, that needs more, I feel that needs more research so we we could get in that, you know, a, a definite percentage ratios of, of what is plain hand and what is crypt hand. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's it's all really fascinating. And I love that in this sense, that there's a sense of a collective, that there's a group of people working on this. And it feels from the way that you talk about it, that it's a very friendly and collaborative kind of process that's happening around her work. Well, uh, in, you know, the much, there's much um, work being written about um, on this uh, and you know, some great work has gone before and it's all testament to people, you know, individuals, hard work. And I feel that everybody wants to um, um, give something out there to the public about Anne Lister. And because she was an extraordinary person and, you know, I, I really applaud anybody who knew who wants to come on board and, and wants to try and transcribe and, and to start reading the journals um, and, you know, there's some fantastic academic theses out there and some academic books that have paved the way for new people coming on board. Um, but there's lots of aspects of Anne's life that have yet to be discovered in detail. Um, and so, again, we're hoping for this um, a more collaborative um, approach to be able to talk about these these new things in her life that have yet that, you know that we need to know about. For example, her travels through Russia. Mm. Um, uh, all of that has yet to be transcribed in full. Um, so it's uh, it's it's all work in hand. And uh, I think you know we you know I'd like to pay testament in this interview to the to to the Halifax archivists in West Yorkshire who who do a fantastic job. Um, and have done over the years preserving Anne's journals um, for the public to go and read. Um, it's such an important document for 
for the local community here to have this. Um, and just to give you some perspective of where I am now, Caroline, I'm actually, I live in the Shipton Valley. Mm. And um, as I'm talking to you now, I'm looking out over the hills and I can just about see Amlister's land from where I'm, from where I'm sitting. Um, it's very green, it's very pretty, it's very rolling. Um, and I think what's really, really encouraging for me when I was writing the book is that I could immerse myself in the landscape that was essentially Amlister's 200 years ago. And... Um, I, uh, you know, she, her writing is rooted in northern landscapes. So I know that when I go out during the day and if I go for a walk, I can walk past the houses that I'm to walk past. And this definitely influenced the way I wrote my book. Absolutely. Um, so it's very, I think in terms of collaboration, I feel like there's a lot of things going on there. Um, previous writers that have gone before, the archivists, new people coming on board. Um, it's, it's, it's all very, very exciting. Definitely. And how exciting that there's a whole era that in some ways has yet to be discovered. That that must be really delicious to think about. Like, oh, what, what will we find out about once we get to that yeah. part? Yeah. And, and the really interesting thing about Anne Lister, of course, is that she she plays tricks with you because you think you just think you kind of get into the to know her a little bit better. And all of a sudden she'll throw a curved ball at you in the diary and think, oh, damn that's wrong. I didn't, I've got that completely wrong. Um, she wasn't talking about that. She was talking about something else. And, and, and of course, you know, her, you know, her diaries are written over a lifetime. So of course, you know, you change as a person over a lifetime, you change over five years, over 10 years. So the person that you were studying at the beginning of the diaries is completely different at the end of the diaries. Um, it's, uh, so there's all these challenges to consider. And, and of course the, the code um, reveals not, I mean, I, I find I find the, the the delights quite often are not in the code. To me, I love the little um, detail of every day, and it can be something as simple as Anne Lister and Anne Walker um, going into Halifax to to buy something like what she describes a, as a revolving plate warmer, which which would have been high tech in the day. It can be mm. something very simple like that. Um, or when she goes into the local shops to buy her books and. And she has a gossip with the local local neighbours. Um, or when she's on her land, you know, and she's she's managing the men and she's telling them what to do, and you know, and she's planting trees. It's it's all of these little daily things that bring this landscape here to life um, for me as a writer and writing the, having written this book. Um, they're the things that speak loudly to me and um, and definitely influence the way and the excitement with which I wrote the book. Absolutely. And how amazing to be able to basically see her land out your window. I can, yeah. It's, it's really fantastic. I mean, I can just see the edge of the land where she sunk one of her coal mines. And um, yeah, I, I can literally walk down the lane from where I live and I can pass at least two or three of the houses that feature prominently in her diaries. And in fact, one of my neighbours who lives at the road lives just a few doors away from me up the road is an ancestor of um, one of Anne's um, uh, business rivals. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm living history here in Shibden Valley. It's, it's fantastic. Amazing. Well, I'm so grateful that we had the chance to speak with you about the process of transcribing the diaries, diving into the story and working in conjunction with Sally Wainwright to create the series Gentleman Jack as well as the book. It's been really wonderful. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Karen. I really enjoyed it. And there's always so much to talk about on Lister. So, um, I, you know, I hope, uh, you know, the, the listeners enjoy it as well. I know they will. Thank you for listening to The Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.